Um, hello from Chicago. My name is Ken Pomeranz, and I'm the faculty director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuin campus in Hong Kong, our premier location in Asia, and the place from which we aim to promote the university's values of free and open and rigorous discussion. Welcome to our second program on China's real estate crisis, which is part of our China on the Move webinar series. You can find our first panel on the real estate crisis on our website, should you want to see it, along with some of our other past programs. Um, we're sharing tonight's event via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the U Chicago campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the question and answers button by first registering with Zoom. And when we wrap up tonight, we'll have a brief poll at the end and some more information about upcoming events that you might be interested in. So stay tuned to the very end. After the first episode of our China real estate mini series, in which our panelists shared their views on the history and social dynamics that have shaped China's current real estate bubble, we continue tonight um, with the discussion on the Evergrande issue, as it's still struggling with about $300 billion in debt, and other developers seem to be lined up behind it with problems of, its own, of their own. Our scholars tonight will give us the overview of the issue through geographic, economic, political and historical lenses. Let me begin by introducing the speakers tonight, and I'm going to introduce them all right at the beginning. Um, our first speaker will be Yo Qian Xing, who is Professor of Geography, Pamela P. Fong, Family Distinguished Chair in China Studies, and Chair of Global Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She's the author of Making Capitalism in China, the Hong Kong, excuse me, the Taiwan Connection, the Great Urban Transformation, Politics of Land and Property in China, which is particularly relevant to our discussions here, as it offers an especially lucid explanation of the complicated processes by which land, especially former farmland, gets converted into urban real estate in China. She's currently working on a very different project, though one still centrally concerned with land, which is Conserving China's Northwest Frontier, which is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. Our second speaker is Dr. Carl Walter. He's worked in China in its financial sector for over 20 years, and he actively participated in many of the country's financial reform efforts, including helping to create China's first overseas IPO in 1992, and serving as a member of senior management at China International Capital Corporation. Um, which is China's first and most successful joint venture investment bank. He also holds a PhD from Stanford University, where he is now a visiting scholar at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. He's the co-author of Red Capitalism, the Fragile Financial Foundation of China's Extraordinary Rise, which is one of those all too rare books that is perfectly understandable for beginners. I've assigned it to undergraduates and simultaneously eye-opening for people who thought they already knew a lot. He's also the author of Privatizing China Inside China's Stock Markets. Last, but by no means least, um, Dr. Matthew Lowenstein is a Hoover Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He studies the economic history of modern China from the late imperial period right through to the early People's Republic. His dissertation, which he's currently turning into a book, is a study of Northern China's indigenous financial system from the late Qing to the early Republican period. And I should note that his PhD is University of Chicago 2021, freshly minted. Other interests include the history of traditional Chinese accounting, the political economy of warlordism, and the history of central economic planning. Um, in addition to his PhD from Chicago, Matt has a MBA from Columbia Business School he previously worked as a securities analyst in Beijing and in New York, covering the Chinese financial sector. He's already published a number of academic articles in leading journals, and his non-academic works have appeared in The Diplomat and Foreign Policy. But speaking as his former advisor, where is that book? All right, 
Um, let us begin. <laughs> um, Professor Shing, please go ahead. Okay, um, thank you, first of all, Ken, for this very kind invitation. It's a, really a pleasure to join you uh, from California. Um, I thought today I will provide a context of Evergrande crisis by tracing the triangular relationship among China's land rights regime, its property market, and public finance. So let's begin with the land rights. In China's constitution, it is stipulated that all urban land belongs to the state. But what is the state? It's a very abstract thing when we really think about it, especially when you think about how does the state own a land in reality? How does a state own land? Um, so it turns out that the state, as China's ultimate landowner, is not one big machine in which every parts work together seamlessly. The state that owns all urban land, according to the constitution, in reality, is made of various and numerous state actors, such as government agencies like the Ministry of Telecommunication or Bureau of Urban Planning, or universities, research institutions, banks, schools, military units, TV stations, newspapers, you name it, hospitals, they own factories and enterprises. All these state agencies, units are part of the state. And all of them have one way or another the access to stay on land in the city. Most of all, it's not just a central state agency in Beijing, but also tens and thousands of local governments at different levels that also have the authority over land in their own jurisdictions. As a result of the state-centered land rights regime at both central and local levels, China's land market since the 1980s is dominated by various and numerous state actors that have the access to urban land and became the most important land suppliers in the property market. So that's a very, very quick a, a briefing of the relationship between China's land rights regime and its property market. So where is the third node in this triangular relationship? The public finance then, especially at the local state level. How does the local state finance work? Since 1994, a central government started to centralize or rather re-centralize is national revenue control and leaving local governments with a very small share of the national revenues, but bigger financial responsibilities for investment in infrastructure construction, public education, and social welfare programs. To date, about 80% of China's infrastructure is financed locally mainly by local governments and their various means to finance them. To pay for these responsibilities, local governments exercise their authority over land and expand their revenue base by selling land in their jurisdictions, establishing development companies themselves and or collaborate with other state and non-state developers, such as Evergrande, and many others to develop projects in their cities, townships, and even villages. More importantly, land was also used as a collateral for bank loans. To get a loan, local government leaders need to first convert farmland to land for non-farm uses, especially for residential and commercial uses in order to increase the property value to qualify for bigger loans. As, and in order to continue to get new loans to pay back the old loans, they need to continuously convert non farm land into, uh, I'm sorry, to convert more farm land into non farm uh, uses. Hence, the extraordinary scale and speed of China's urban expansion in the past half a century. 
this triangular relationship among China's land rights regime, property development, and local state finance went through several changes in the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. But the basic triangular structure remains intact. Now, how did Evergrande fall into this, curse up, this uh, circumstances? Evergrande, which is a non-state-owned firm, owes much of its rapid growth to the partnership with hundreds of local governments and their development for arms. Evergrande's home turf was in Shenzhen, one of the fastest growing cities in China. But since the mid 2000s, at the peak of China's property uh, development, the company rapidly spread to many other cities. The company worked with local governments all over the country to gain access to land and establish project firms in over 200 cities and gain access to bank loans backed by local governments. This pattern of partnership between developers and local governments encountered a problem, however, since 2016, when the central government once, once more tried to control the ever-rising housing price and to curb property speculation. This time, the policy focus is to limit the bank loans to developers, but home buyers can still get mortgage at an affordable rate. So developers, after their direct access to bank loans were tightened, they tried to finance their projects through pre-sales to home buyers. Now, the key here is for developers to be eligible for pre-sales of their project, the project construction needs to reach certain level of completion. So the new game since the mid 2010s is to speed up the initial construction phase of a project in order to be eligible for the developer to sell their homes, their projects before their completion. And after the developer gets the license for pre-sales, the home buyer will start paying cash in installments when their homes were half or less than half completed. This new regulation of limiting the bank loans directly to developers as a way for the central government to control speculation and housing price hikes has two consequences, which will help us to understand the making of the Evergrande crisis. First of all, since the mid 2010s, the role of home buyers as property investors became increasingly important. Since the mid 2010s, the percentage of projects financed by individual home buyers increased from less than 30% to over 60%. The money comes from family savings, private loans, as well as mortgage. So that they, you know, home buyers wittingly or unwittingly, they become the investor. Uh, one of the most important investors are in property market. Second, there are many new projects raised to get started in order to get a license for pre-sales now appearing in many cities at a time when the economy is slowing down. Since the most desirable projects, properties are in large metropolitan centers, like Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou. And these cities are already built up for the most part. And whatever land left in these cities, they are four to five times more expensive than the national average. So many of the new projects that we just mentioned that went through this rush start and, uh, and are actually in the much less desirable uh, desirable, uh, desirable smaller cities, which much cheaper land. So that's why, you know, developer local government can work together to get these projects going, but because they are much less uh, uh, expensive, um, but they are also less desirable. Uh, so these are the projects and places, smaller cities in a more remote area, uh, uh, in a stagnated economy that face the greatest difficulty in skills in their sales, you know, so they, they build up, they have 
uh, 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 completed, but they have much more difficulty in selling these units. Some of them see breakdown of cash flow, uh, cash flows, and uh, which consequently, uh, 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 which consequently uh, 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 um, led to hearted construction. Hence, the emergence of these skeleton buildings, so called, or the rotten tail buildings, uh, Lan Wei Lou in Chinese. This is the making of the Evergrande crisis. It's a national scale crisis with varied local expressions. But I think I will stop here uh, since my time is up, and I will talk more about the future uh, after the first round of presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, Carl, can you take the next leg? That was an excellent exposition, uh, Professor Singh, of the real estate market in China. I am hardly a real estate specialist, but I've been spending my, I spent my time in recent years looking at the fiscal system in China and trying to understand it, thinking that that was a piece of the economic or financial puzzle that I really didn't understand when I wrote <clears throat> read capitalism 10 years ago. Uh, and so uh, I, I came to the point where I had an appreciation of, of China's budgetary history. And, and, and it goes back back into the 30s, which I hope Matt will talk about. Uh, when, when, the, when they try, when the Republic in China tried to establish a national budget. But at the time, even the national budget back then is so hard to remember really didn't extend beyond the city walls of Nanking. And the local, local governments, whether warlord or even farther local, were really uh, quite independent and self-reliant. Things did not change much after 1949. And uh, despite the Soviet effort to get a planned economy with a, with a budget system in it, I think that was all, all uh, disrupted by Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, so by the time we begin, arrive at the beginning of the beginning of the reform period, China really did not have a, a systematic, strong fiscal system which could channel the country's resources <clears throat> into the government. Instead, you had uh, myriad local governments that were quite self-reliant and used to developing their own financial resources. So over time, uh, especially during the 1990s, the issue really became after 1994 about the, the issue, the problem of these extra budgetary resources local governments had, had, had developed. So there was an entire, what I call a shadow fiscal system that had been built up. And uh, by the time 1997 arrived and we began to be able to uh, sell land use rights on a larger scale than a simple one-off basis to joint ventures. By that time uh, it arrived, the local governments really were looking forward to a new uh, source of revenue. And that was your sale of land use rights. <clears throat> but the problem with the sale of land use rights is that you may have a piece of land somewhere that somebody wants to buy, but there's stuff on top of it. So before a developer can buy it or even begin to, to, to build buildings on it or parks or what have you, the local government has to, has to remove the people who live there, the buildings that exist there, uh, or if it's a, a blank piece of land like agricultural land, then you have to put in the infrastructure, power, lights, water, sewer, uh, that a developer needs for his buildings. So in addition to the revenues that these things, that these, that the sale of land use rights uh, gives you, you also have a tremendous amount of expenses associated with preparing the property for, for eventual development. If you, since, since uh, 2010, the Ministry of Finance has begun publishing the expense, expenses related to land use rights. And if you look at them, you will see that there's really not a, there really is not much revenue associated with land use right sales. But that's not really the point anyway. Local governments don't care about making, what well, don't make, don't care about making so-called profit if you could account for it. They care about making GDP and perhaps getting some money off the top for other things. <clears throat> so 
let's take an example of 2014. The total the total sales of uh, of land use rights across the country that year were 3.4 trillion RMB. The expenses associated with land use rights development or land development was 3.8 trillion. This is a gap of almost 40 billion US dollars. So, so local governments have to borrow or arrange through trust companies or other means the money that they need to get this process started. And over time, they become a, become a prisoner of the, the process of selling, paying for the expenses, selling some more. So one, that is one reason why, as Professor Xing has mentioned, these, the cities have grown so much. Just simply look at Beijing or any, any city, the suburbs are huge. <clears throat> um, so uh, uh, my final point is really that uh, this Ponzi scheme forces them to continue to develop. And it also forces developers to continue to build. And that's why I think there are really, I understand 64 million empty apartment buildings, 60, 64 million empty apartments across the country. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Matt, you wanna take it home? Terrific. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yotian and Carl. That, that was uh, really great. Um, so I'll, I'll take it from there and talk a little bit about why this is uh, important to the um, real economy and the financial system in China and a bit about you know, what we can expect uh, in the future. So the reason this is important to the real economy, you know, why you should care even if you're not a property developer or, or an investor in, uh, or a speculator in property, um, is that the jet fuel of the Chinese economy, of the Chinese economic miracle, is investment. Sometimes you'll hear uh, of China is referred to as an export-led economy, but that really hasn't been true in decades. Uh, investment makes up about 43% of Chinese GDP. That is astronomical for a, an economy of China's size by any kind of historical standard. Um, you know, most, most countries, it's, it's something like 20-odd percent. Um, and investment-driven economies are inherently less uh, stable. They're, they're riskier than um, uh, economies that run on consumption. And if you think of why, let's, let's imagine a toy economy, a toy model that's, that's uh, a country where all they do is, um, is make chocolate. And all their consumption is people eating chocolate bars. And their only investment is building new, fact, new chocolate factories to make more chocolate bars. Well. Uh, if they're not building any more factories, it's very stable. They build the same, they, they make the same number of uh, chocolate bars each year. They eat the same amount. GDP never goes up or down. But if the, um, if the government in the People's Republic of Chocolate or the PRC decides that they want to grow the GDP by 6%, then um, they have to start incentivizing people to build uh, lots of chocolate factories every year. And uh, that's great. It means you get uh, more and more chocolate to eat every year. But at some point, you might have too many factories. People can't eat that much chocolate. And then you're going to have to start closing down excess capacity. And that's called a recession. And the problem gets trickier when you add financing. So um, uh, people refer to Chinese growth as debt-driven growth, which and to it, in, in a sense, that's a little unfair, because almost all new projects are financed by debt. When you open up a new chocolate factory, you need, uh, you need to buy the land, you need to buy the equipment, you need to pay salaries before you start making a product. So usually you're borrowing money to do that. And that's fine as long as once you're operating, you make enough money to, um, to pay back the debt and still earn a profit. Uh, the problem is once you get over capacity, if you can't make that money, not only do you have to start closing down uh, factories, but you also start to get bad debt. And if you get too much of that, it can even uh, start to, your banks can lose money. Um, it can turn into a, a financial crisis. So in China, fully 40% of economic activity is devoted to investment, to building you know, new stuff. But instead of chocolate factories, they build, uh, they build real estate. And um, uh, you know, a lot of other stuff too, but property takes up probably about a third of the Chinese GDP um, all in, and that's, also astronomical. In most countries, it's it's you know 10 to 20 percent. Um, and so as China 
builds more and more every year, invests more and more every year, they build up more and more debt. And again, that's not necessarily bad. If the investment is good investment, then, uh, then you'll grow out of the debt. Uh, if all these new uh, projects were going into creating new Shenzhens, um, then it's fine. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons to think that's not true. Uh, and and I, I think uh, uh, Yotian and Carl touched on, on two, um, uh, the most important reasons. But we can also see this in the data. So Chinese debt to, debt to GDP is growing really fast. It's almost doubled. Uh, it's at 290% now, over 150% uh, um, about a decade ago. And that means that uh, the economy is not growing fast enough to keep up with the debt. Uh, we can also see this um, in the, the phenomena that uh, uh, Carl and Yotian have mentioned, the proliferating um, uh, suburbs, these uh, Xinchu, Xincheng, new development everywhere you go in China, you know, even in sort of uh, way out in the middle of nowhere in, in, in places like Inner Mongolia. Um, and we can see it in the, uh, uh, in the homeownership rate. So China, Chinese, China's homeownership rate is 96%. That's um, uh, way higher than in the US, which is about two thirds. And so it suggests that probably people may not meet, need all these new units, uh, sooner or later, uh, this, can't, this, this is going to stop, and then that debt is going to be a big problem. Um, and, and the longer this goes on, and the more excess debt you get, then the worse the, uh, uh, the hangover will be when you stop. So the reason we're seeing stress in property markets today is that for a long time, uh, uh, as Yotian said, really since, since the mid-2010s, um, the government has been trying to various ways to cool down the property sector. And they've done this in two different ways. Uh, sometimes they've uh, targeted demand, consumer demand, restriction, where they've said only people who have the right hukou can buy, or we're not going to let uh, couples uh, buy more than um, uh, you know, one or two apartments. And then you get these you know, fake divorces so that, that the same family can own a lot more apartments than they're supposed to. Um, these are, are generally called xian go or buying restrictions. Uh, those haven't worked too well. The other solution is to target supply. And that's historically uh, meant uh, limiting the amount of money that banks can lend to property developers. And this is the historical reason for the uh, uh, blossoming of the Chinese shadow banking sector. The Chinese shadow banking sector is essentially a, uh, a bian tong dao, a loophole for banks to lend to, to property and local governments uh, around various restrictions that um, uh, the central government has tried to impose on them. Uh, moreover, every time the central government has tried to impose these restrictions, the, the consequences, both the, the fiscal consequences that Carl alluded to and the uh, uh, consequences for GDP growth that um, have been so frightening that they've gotten wet feet and they've backed off. Uh, so this brings us to last year, when the People's Bank of China and the Chinese Security uh, or Regulatory Commission uh, passed a new set of regulations called the Three Red Lines, the San Dao Hong Xian. And these um, uh, limited the amount of debt uh, not that, that property developers could have on their balance sheet. So by sort of uh, putting the red lines directly onto the property developers, they made it, the, it much harder to evade um, uh, uh, these regulatory controls. And this triggered a panic. Why? Because as Yotian said, property developers uh, use their pre-sales to finance uh, construction. And this means that property uh, developers are kind of like a bank themselves. And just as a bank requires new deposits to pay off old deposits, uh, developers require pre-sales to complete their old projects and pay, pay back their buyers. So if I'm a buyer and I think uh, there's this new policy and you as a property developer are not gonna be able to borrow more money, then I don't know that you'll be able to complete your projects. I'm not gonna buy, uh, I'm not gonna buy your pre-sales. So it triggers a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in which um, uh, all of a sudden, these property developers uh, that are heavily indebted find that no one trusts them to be able to finish their projects. So banks won't lend to them, buyers won't buy from them, and, and they suffer the equivalent of a bank run. 
And that's exactly what happened with Evergrande. Uh, if Evergrande could wave a magic wand and sell all of their, their uh, assets for the, the same market price that uh, healthier developers could sell them at, they would be fine. But in a panic, all of a sudden, no one trusts you, no one wants your assets. And um, uh, as uh, both previous speakers have said, it's not really just an Evergrande problem. There are hundreds, at, at least 100 developers with uh, similar problems. So um, oh, what is the, the fallout of this? Uh, well, it seems that since, since the peak of the crisis last year in, in November, once again, the government is starting to get uh, wet feet. Uh, it's, uh, it's starting to lose its nerve. And there, it's uh, loosening sub rosa these restrictions on, on lending to uh, property developers. And you're seeing um, credit again start to go to property developers, mostly through the shadow banking system. But the, uh, the re relaxation on, these, uh, on the restrictions has not been equally relaxing to everyone. Uh, and what we're seeing is that uh, state-owned uh, property developers now ha have an easier time ignoring the, uh, the formal restrictions than private developers. In fact, the People's Bank of China is uh, credibly rumored to have compiled a whitelist saying essentially uh, which, which developers are allowed to get uh, new funding, are allowed to ignore the new rules, and, and every single one of uh, the whitelisted developers are, are state-owned enterprises. Um, and what they've also, we've also seen, and this is crucial, is they've said that certain merger loans will be excluded from the restrictions. Now, that sounds a little confusing, but it's very simple. It means if I'm a, a state-owned enter enterprise, maybe the bank won't lend me money to go build a new, uh, a new project but they will lend me money to buy up uh, some other uh, uh, property company. And this is uh, a very similar dynamic that we've seen in other industries, uh, coal um, uh, in particular, where the uh, central government will implement some policies that first make things painful for the whole industry, drive the private operators into financial distress, and then it will uh, uh, give credit to uh, uh, give financing to state-owned enterprises to buy up the old private operators and consolidate the sector. Um, I don't ex I don't know if it'll be as drastic in property as it has been for other industries, but that's uh, that's certainly the trend. Um, and uh, uh, I, th I think uh, I'm starting to go over time, so I'll I'll uh, yield it back there, but uh, and 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 talk more in Q and A. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, before we get to audience questions. I'd like to just give the panel a little bit of a chance to talk to each other for a few minutes and to maybe seed that discussion a bit. You know, one of the things that becomes clear, I think, from listening to all of you is that however this mess gets resolved, we're going to see both a change in relations between central government and local governments and a change between in the relationship between state-owned firms and private ones but exactly what those changes are is not all that clear i mean i think it's easy to imagine that all this becomes part of a still further centralization by beijing and that essentially in return for bailing a bunch of people out, they get increased control and that the state-owned sector also gets equal increased control. But you can also imagine some other scenarios. So I guess I'd like to hear you kick around a little bit how you think mm -hmm. muddling through this crisis is going to change various kinds of power relationships. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, no, first of all, I really enjoy listening to Carol and, and Matt. I, you know, this is a, a great opportunity to, to really hear from the financial experts. Um, you know, I want to respond directly to Ken's question about local government um, in terms of changing central local relationship. I think what's intriguing about this new development of this of this uh, uh, crisis is that now the government continues to play a key role as a crisis manager 
even though they are part of the problem, they are now part of the solution. Um, so they, um, you know, in that triangular relationship I was just uh, uh, um, presenting, um, they are asked now to solve the problem locally. And then, again, the question comes to the same set of uh, uh, concerns. What kind of resources do they really have, these go local government leaders, where they got a lot of rotten tail buildings in their uh, 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 jurisdiction? What kind of resources do they really have in hand, other than what they've been using all alone to resolve this financial and real estate entanglement? And also, on top of that, they have to you know, try to resume the construction project if possible, in order to in, to keep these enraged home buyers uh, uh, from launching uh, more protests. You know, social stability is the number one concern. Again, it falls on the shoulder of local government. And you know, so you know, I think I don't have an answer, but I see how that becomes a cyclical uh, 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 issue there. Yeah, I, I just jump in because uh, the, the the issue isn't Evergrande or the property developers. The issue is the local governments, because the the Evergrande just took advantage of the vulnerability of the fiscal vulnerability of local governments. They jumped in, they bought the land, and then the local governments are involved in this process. So they got to got to borrow more. You read that the local governments now have to resolve the problems that have been left behind by Evergrande. Where are they going to get the money? The bank's going to lend to them. If you step back again and look at the bigger picture, if, if you could if you could understand China's financial position, you could see that all this is going to do is create more leverage. I mean, Matt's mentioned the total leverage of the, or the total debt of the country is like 290 percent. But if, but what we should really be looking at is the state sector, because as you mentioned, the money is going to state state guys to buy out to buy out the properties of these private guys. The state guys are lousy. Otherwise, they would be the ones that were in there in the first place. So all you're going to do is going to add more to the state. I mean, the central government plus the local government's debt load, which is going to go up. So at some point, there has to be an end to the amount of financial resources the state has. And what resources are those? They are bonds. They can issue bonds, but the bonds are just being bought by themselves. So where, where else do they get money? They get money from deposits. Where did the deposits come from? They came from the wonderful 10 years of the WTO, where the low, where, where both corporations and uh, private uh, moms and pops saved a load of money. But after all, at the end of the day, you're going to run out of that money. Right now, if you look at the loan to deposit ratio of the banks, it's 80%. Before this all started, it was around it was around 60 for the for the 62% for the major banks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would say you know if, if you if you wanted to put uh, central local uh, uh, relations on a on a sustainable, healthy footing, sort of there's oddly enough, people kind of agree on on the first thing to do, which is a property tax. Um, sort of all economists to. Uh, I don't, can't speak for all economists, but it's it's pretty widely uh, recognized that. You know, land taxes are the most you know theoretically efficient form of tax. Uh, very hard to do. Uh, a property tax of some kind is usually a, 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 a both so, you know uh, socially uh, stabilizing, and it would allow local governments to raise money uh, without being dependent on um, you know unsustainable uh, land sales. Uh, the, the the problem is. Um, you know, you, you can probably, there's probably not a single year uh, where I haven't read a story about a pilot program to institute a land tax. And um, uh, everyone always gets very excited about it. And they say, oh my God, they're finally going to do, and, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Tiana and Carl probably have a similar reaction to, to, to me when I, when you see this, you know, I just think it'll, it'll never happen. Uh, because a, a property tax is a uh, guan shui. Tax. Yeah. yeah, yes, <laughs> but but it's not that kind of guan shui. It's not an, uh, a a tariff. It's a, a tax on uh, on officials. Um, so uh, uh, so there, there's really the, the the thing that should happen is is politically uh, extremely difficult to do. Um, 
you know, barring that, uh, what happens is that, um, uh, you know, local governments either have to keep finding, uh, they have to keep selling the silverware, which is where you get this unsustainable Ponzi system, or you get this other dynamic, which we're seeing, which is um, uh, they, they increase increasing uh, subsidies to SOEs uh, so that SOEs can, um, so that the local, their, their own companies can, can make a profit, which they get to get to play around with. But, um, uh, you know, neither of those are, are good for the economy or, or particularly sustainable. I wish I didn't have a property tax. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, I think it's because uh, they don't have the political guts to, to do it. And, and for so long, I mean, all these taxes that they were going to put in place, they yeah. all just sort of disappear. So if you look at the uh, fiscal system, the expenditures for the last several years have way outrun the level of revenues uh, at the national level, including central and local governments. I mean, and, and if you really wanted to include all the debt that's been run up locally, it would look even uglier. So I, so I, I that's what I say. I just don't know when the uh, when when this when the story runs out because at the end of the day, uh, unless uh, you continue to depend on your export exports sector to drive the creation of Rinmin B by uh, collecting dollars, uh, then they're going to run they're going to run out of the uh, balance sheet. So since they're not helping the private sector very much these days, it, it really adds a double whammy to the problem. Yeah, that reminds me of a conversation I had almost 20 years ago uh, as a response to Matt Common, you know, about tax, uh, property tax, uh, the possibility of, you know, doing that in China. A journalist told me, she said, uh, if they are going to tax my property, I want to vote for my mayor. Um, <laughs> so that I think that really also helps me to understand uh, 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 what's happening in you know the relationship there. Well, the real question is who owns the foreign exchange reserves? <laughs> if you if you had a balance sheet for the uh, state. You know, on the asset side, you would have some some uh, some loans, including mortgages, and you'd have some state enterprises. And on the other side, you'd have some bonds, and you'd have household deposits, and you would have uh, state equity if there was any. Uh, so, uh, if you match, if you look at this thing carefully and say, "All right, well, are there sufficient assets to pay off the depositors?" Uh, if you could make that kind of calculation, it would be very interesting. Then, then I understand what the, what the guy is saying completely. Let me use those last couple comments to sort of both ask another question, but transition to the questions from the audience. So you know, what we've heard very eloquently from all of you is that we've had a series of ultimately unsustainable booms, right? There was an export-led one that couldn't go on forever. There was a infrastructure and big investment one, you know, where they built airports everywhere in sight and so forth. More recently, there's been a real estate one. So is this the end of the line? Or is something like tech the next place the money goes? And if it's the end of the line, does the end of the line, does it look like Japan 92? Does it look even worse? Um, where do we go if we can't keep going the way we've been going? Personally, I think it doesn't look good because of the demographics. And I'll just stop there. Everybody is aware of the demographic situation. So you have household deposits and banks large, largely so huge because of the social factors uh, surrounding people's lives. There's not a reliable social security system. There's not enough kids to support you. So you have only your deposits. What happens over the next 10 years when those deposits get drawn down? And those are the things that are financing the state, the st the state and its actions right now. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess what I what I would say is when when I uh, Yo Tian, do you mind if I I, I go first or, or just uh, yeah? No, go ahead, okay. please. So, um, yeah, can, can your comment remind me of that Onion article? Uh, yes. You know, uh, uh, Americans demand a new bubble to invest in, in uh, uh, from from uh, I, I guess two thousand eight or or maybe from earlier. Um, you know, the the investment has been the driver of the economy for a really really long time. Uh, I, I want I want to say it's been bigger than exports since since the nineties. And uh, uh, and that 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 works, uh, and it's fine to have a boom that's unsustainable. Ultimately, <clears throat> all of them are. Um, but the the problem has been really since since uh, two thousand eight or so, since the stimulus. Then um, there's been it's just been harder and harder to find uh, uh, investment that really justifies its, itself economically. And and um, you know you don't know how much of this in, the investment is bad, but you do know that there are a lot of ghost cities. You know that um, debt to GDP is growing. Uh, if you look at the money supply, it used to be you know, before uh, in, in the early two thousands, it was something like M two. The money supply was something like a hundred plus percent of GDP, very similar to most countries around the world. Now it's it's you know, over double that. So, so it's um, so money is 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 um, is going around and credit and their new debt is is forming, but it's not producing the same kind of bang in terms of of output that it used to. Um, so I I don't think I don't think tech uh, is a miracle solution. Um, I think tech is good. I think it will help help consumers, but it's not sort of nothing's big enough to replace property. Uh, that, that's that's the real problem. Railways, railway. Well, <laughs> that that's true, but you, you got an awful lot of railways too. You know, I, I, does, but the railway is also part of the property strategy. Yes, um, exactly. that's the thing. Right. Um, yeah, no, I I have no clue what to do. If I know, I won't be sitting here. Exactly, um, I'll be rich. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I think there's one thing about, you know, whatever solution that we come up with, there is always a, a, a regional uh, 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 unevenness, right? So with tech, you know, even in California or in the US at large, um, only certain cities really benefit from technology, you know, from all the clustering and, and all. And then in China, I think actually what this uh, Evergrande crisis exposes us, us to is the, uh, or making us really aware of is how big and in, how much it has been increased in terms of regional disparity. You know, mm -hmm. I think home buyers and investors, property developers and, and financiers uh, whose interest really focusing in you know, in Beijing or Shanghai or Shenzhen, probably are not as nearly as much affected as those who are in the small cities and finding no real buyers or, you know, uh, uh, their land is so cheap that doesn't really count anything uh, uh, for their bank loans. So this kind of regional disparity in the continuation of the centrality of these metropolitan centers and their dominant position uh, in the national economy and continue to draw talents, to draw capital, and to draw all kinds of infrastructure, top universities and university-related property projects continue to go up. These are all the great advantage of few centers in the very large city, a uh, large country. So, you know, whatever strategies we come up with, we have to also combat and consider that immense regional disparity uh, on to begin with that yeah no, yeah if so, i can just so true yeah just to sort of piggyback on that right if you think of a developer like evergrande that is all over the country and now has units that it may not be able to finish all over the country boy it has to sell a lot of units in 
in Gansu to make up for even one unsold one in Shanghai. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> that's yeah. a big problem. Yeah, that's right. So their projects have much less problem in, you know, in it, but in the sense is they, you know, their recent development actually are all scattered into Gansu type of place. Um, yeah. I just want to wrap off of uh, the tech issue. I mean, there's a wonderful article in the uh, Wall Street Journal today about two failed so-called semiconductor yeah. places. I mean, mm -hmm. this is the whole problem. Yeah. Local governments like those in Jinan and elsewhere are so vulnerable to guys who are, who are flim flam men. So now the idea is tech. So we're gonna build a kiln there and, and make semiconductors. That's, and so the local government coughs up money You've got to be kidding me. They don't have any money. So I, I think the real issue is, put it another way, it's really not the state's job to develop semiconductor plants. It is the private sector's job. And if you have the state trying to do it, as it has been doing, you're just going to waste money. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I think that's that's instructive, too, in, in where we're, we're actually seeing um, uh, state industrial policy grow. Um, it's pretty clear that that um, you know green policies in China uh, are more or less an extension of, of uh, the same kind of industrial policy that you've seen for uh, decades and decades. And it's it's um, you know uh, uh, the central government sort of apportioning financing to local governments, apportioning it to to sort of favored players, <clears throat> and. And in a, to a sense, this has been happening in solar for a long and wind power for a long time in China. Um, and the problem is, you know, that kind of um, uh, developmental status approach, it can ramp up production of things that you can make easily really quickly. Um, but then you're, you're essentially, you know, this is something you do instead of steel. It's not, um, uh, it's not really a new method. It's just, um, well, maybe it's another bubble that will last for another 10 years, but, but, uh, um, but it doesn't solve the problem of, of requiring more debt and more investment to uh, pay for uh, legacy debt. How about one last, one, one last comment for me. I mean, if you if you are looking at this at the state to do all this, then how come the state budget is not benefiting from the state sector? Sure, it gets taxes and stuff like that, but the dividends from the SOEs and so on hardly make it to Beijing. Yeah. So what is the point of having all these things out there besides employment? State um, grid is, uh, I think. I don't know if it's you, you or Anne who, who who likes to use that example, Carl. But it's it's you know should should be one of the most profitable countries in the world. Uh, essentially, a monopoly on electricity. I don't think it's ever turned a profit uh, because by the time um, uh, you know by and the time the guy who runs it tried to take it private in his own pocket. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, let me try and sort of collapse a couple of questions that we had from the audience and turn them into one, which is that we've talked a fair amount about the, the home buyers who are now in danger of being left out to dry. They've paid for apartments that they don't know if they'll be finished. Um, but of course, the property companies have other, have other um, creditors too, right? Lumber companies, steel companies, et cetera, et cetera. What's going to happen to them? And is this a big enough effect that it's going to really matter to, say, foreign countries that sell basic primary commodities to, to China? It's going to be pretty, pretty grim. Uh, I mean, if, if you look at something like Chinese, Chinese real estate alone, not China, Chinese real estate pr probably uh, accounts for something like 16% of the, the entire world steel. Uh, so um, yeah, so every, every 100 tons of steel that, the, that America produces, 40 of it goes to China, uh, 16 of it goes into to property. And, um, and a lot of the rest of that, by the way, goes into, into railways or, or things like it, which is 
as, as Yotian quite uh, astutely pointed out, is a, is a derivative of property in many, many ways. So um, yeah, iron ore is going to take it on the chin. Uh, uh, steel is going to take it on the chin. Uh, cement, I think, I think China is also responsible for it's some ridiculous amount out of the world cement. So in, in three years, Chinese cement consumption uh, is more than uh, all of U.S. cement consumption in the entire 20th century. Um, uh, so uh, now people build with more cement than they do. So it's it's kind of a little cute, but but none, nevertheless, um, uh, and cement tends to be a local business. But nevertheless, you know, if you're in in sort of a cement or upstream uh, industries like um, uh, gravel and and that sort of thing, it's it's going to be rough. Uh, yeah, so it all just points to local governments being being uh, in, in real trouble uh, ultimately because uh, those gravel companies or the cement companies or the or the engineering companies and construction companies are all local guys. So we're 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 more concerned about employment and social stability. Uh, how do you create that? And I think that I think that's going to be uh, very difficult. It, Matt, you commented earlier this this evening on uh, the, the real estate sector as a whole accounted for 30 percent of uh, China's GDP. And I think that same paper mentioned that you cut that thing out, then you're going to be cutting GDP growth down by 10 or 15 or 20 percent. So so. Uh, <clears throat> Aside from everything else that Mr. O, Mr. Mr. Xi is facing, I think this this is a huge problem that he's got to do something with very soon. He's going to be constrained in what he can do, um, I think, by the amount of borrowing that's going to have to go on to stimulate the economy enough to keep keep things where they are as this, as 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 the real estate sector stabilizes. Yeah. You know, when, when we talked about earlier about sort of what might the future be, I think, I think it was Carl who made the very good point that we have to keep demography in the picture, right? That the slowdown is going to be exacerbated by the demographic shift and the sort of infinite, num almost infinite amounts of deposits that have been rolling into banks sooner or later that stops too as the population ages and more people withdraw their money. Another side of this that I think we haven't talked about at all actually tonight is that is the process of urbanization itself, right? So much of this real estate growth has been driven by the greatest movement in human history from countryside to city. At a certain point, there just aren't enough people left in the countryside to relocate to the cities. How does that figure into this story? I think of another way. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but I'll just say something short. I think it's the reverse, Ken. They're building all this infrastructure, but nobody's going to come. Mm -hmm. By 2050, uh, by 2100, or 2100, I guess it is. Good gosh, I can't count that far. Uh, you're going to have the population of 1975. Who's gonna Who's gonna walk down the aisles of all those huge airports? Uh, Ken, I you know I I think that urbanization question again, uh, you know, given the size of China, mm. uh, and there are still uh, towns and you know county seat, mm -hmm. you know level cities, and and they the thing is they don't grow on the basis of economic principle. Mm -hmm. From what I see, uh, it's really a social and cultural mm -hmm. uh, uh, based expansion in certain areas. For example, I have been you know, trying to locate all the fastest growing local cities. Mm -hmm. And they are all the uh, 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 sites where the best or top ranking high schools are located. Exactly. Right. So it's really a Gaokao driven milieu mm -hmm. of, you know, mm -hmm. urban education mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. being one of, in my, to my surprise, actually, 
uh, the most important way of sustaining this seemingly most unsustainable pattern of urban expansion mm -hmm. in the least expected types of place. Um, and it's not just, you know, some exceptional cases. It's actually very, very persistent across different types of provinces and regions based mm -hmm. on very different types of economies. And I think that schooling, I won't say education, mm -hmm. but it's really schooling driven and ranked schooling. Uh, no, everything's ranked. It's a very hierarchical society, as we know. And schools are ranked, cities are ranked, and school ranking and city ranking are absolutely interwoven and informing one another. And that together inform the property price ranks mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, you know, that kind of social cultural elements in understanding the, you know, the, the nuances, nuances of, of China's poverty future, mm -hmm. uh, I think should play a role. Another thing I read recently by an economist in, based in China called Zhang Bing. I've never met him, but I think his recent article I'm happy to share with you uh, is very informative. And he mentioned one thing, you know, and he's very, very, he's not optimistic about the future of China's property market. And the title of his article is called China Cannot Afford Property Markets uh, mm -hmm. Hard Landing, meaning that he's really thinking that it's probably gonna you know, if we are not careful enough. Um, so he says, actually, one thing that makes China different from, you know, Japan's bubble uh, uh, on the IFA uh, 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 Japanese property uh, uh, markets uh, bursting bubble is that family savings. So the family saving and the ability to pay back the <laughs> mortgage, the way to hold savings, um, at least uh, statistically speaking, uh, are still quite solid, meaning that as long as Chinese still have a lot of family savings. Mm -hmm. So this is all theory. You know, everybody talks about that in East Asia uh, 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 crisis as well. Um, but then that's his view. But I think that, you know, we all need to do some more research on this. Um, but these are the anecdotes that I think we can really uh, uh, follow through further to understand how exactly and whether we do have alternatives or not. I, I can't help adding that it's not just that growth tends to go to the, the small cities that have good schools. It's that in case the good schools in town weren't enough incentive for you to move, they simply closed a huge number of the rural schools. Yeah, that is true. school at all, you've got to move. And that's why they, they concentrate mm -hmm. population in several central cities at the local level <laughs> in that they uphold these mega schools uh, that way. So one example is a uh, 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 high school called Hengshui in Hebei. They recently you know, uh, 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 got into some trouble because they expanded into 20 plus school because they are number two high school in China. So they, they use their brand name to establish a lot of private school all over. So wherever you have a property project, you have one of the Hengshui Gaozhong, Hengshui High School there to draw buyers and to really jack up the property price. So how sustainable is it? As soon okay. as Daoka continues. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Do these sort of, do these ersatz Hengshui schools, you know, do they do they offer a better, better education? Is there, they offer very good admission rates to okay. top universities. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you know that really sells very well. It's a brand. Wow. It's a. It's a really. It's a brand. But then you know, uh, I don't know any more about this. But then I just think that there are all these other right. factors, processes, um, that I just don't understand, and I'm very intrigued by. It's easy to get money. <laughs> Um, I want to read um, maybe one more question from the from the audience, which is a, a long one, but I think it's a thoughtful one. It says, assuming the panelists believe China cannot grow out from under its accumulated debt burden, do they envision a deflationary workout, i.e. massive bad debt write-offs, or an inflationary, quote, solution via money printing? 
While the latter might seem intuitively preferable, at least politically, it would mean massive RMB depreciation, the end of RMB internationalization, and severe loss of international investment confidence. Um, what are your what are your thoughts about that that posing of the alternate scenarios? Yeah, I really like this question. So, so it's really a choice between the the, the heat death and the cold cold death of the the universe, isn't it? Um, and um, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll take the questions backward. I think I think the end of R and B internationalization is is not really something I would be terribly worried about if I were in uh, Jung Nan Hai because R and B internationalization is not that impressive. I, I mean, there's there's a lot of good statistics. You know, impressive statistics, but what it mostly means is that um, some people use China's uh, uh, their alternative Swiss SWIFT to do settlement and clearing when they're importing and exporting from China. Basically, nobody, other than that, I, basically nobody uses uh, RMB overseas, um, and and it's um, it's hard to see that changing without. Um, uh, you know, with with such a when China has such a strong uh, export um, uh, surplus, so I, I think there, the, the 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 I think the RMB internationalization is is like the uh, property tax uh, written about uh, a lot and uh, uh, not forthcoming. <clears throat> um, similarly, international investor confidence uh, it, to the extent that. Um, uh, in, international investment is important to China. It's really still, it's still FDI, in my opinion, that that's important to the the economy. Um, and it's it's what they want is high tech. And I, I don't think I don't see that um, as as terribly uh, impacted to the kind of um, uh, uh, commodities and secondary market uh, disruption that you'd be looking at in the event of a, a, a Chinese slowdown. Um, yeah, a, a lot of uh, sort of uh, funds that invest in, in Hong Kong and Shanghai markets are going to um, uh, lose interest, but um, but it, but but th th these are not. Carl knows a lot more about the stock. Carl wrote the book on the Chinese stock market, but but so I'll let him him pick it up from here. But suffice to say, um, the Ch Chinese equity markets don't don't serve as a a compass for the real economy to the same extent that, that they do in the US. So, so it's not that big a concern. Um, uh, uh, and now I'll, I think I've, I've, I've talked long enough, so I'll, I'll let uh, uh, Carl and uh, you know, I'll jump Carl in then. take a crack at it. <laughs> I think, uh, OK, so is it a deflation or is it inflation? I don't think it could possibly be an inflation. And as for a deflation or a write off of a massive bad debt, I don't think it's that I don't think they can do that either because I don't think they know where the debt is. I mean, if anything else, uh, Evergrande is 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 not the most important thing to be talking about now. It's really China Huaro, the largest asset management company that cleaned up the banks. That thing that that thing got blamed on corruption by poor Mr. Lyshell, who was a good friend of mine actually. But uh, 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 but it was in fact that the thing was bursting at the seams. I mean, even Ernst and Young belatedly tells us it had 320 billion of bad loans inside of it. I mean, for God's sake, they're supposed to work those out. So if you want to deflate, it's, it's really hard. I think one of the in these kind of discussions with Chinese always is is very very constructive, as as Professor Singh has said. Uh, one of them told me that uh, a senior official told me that they've designed the system so that it cannot um, cannot go bankrupt. And how did they do that? <clears throat> Another friend explained, and, and he drew a big balloon. And inside that balloon, there's a lot of little balloons. So as long as the problem is in a little balloon, they can solve it. The question about ever that Evergrande poses, and even even China Huarong poses, is. Is it a little balloon? So that's that's my comment. Uh, I add one more thing. Since everything is in these little balloons, nobody knows how many there are. So how can you know how to deflate? Thank you. 
yeah, I have no further comment. I really, uh, you know, enjoy listening to both of them. All those little balloons are your local governments. <laughs> right, so you can't grow out of it. You can't deflate out of it. You can't inflate out of it. They, they could grow out of it. They all, all they have to do is let the private sector take over instead of crushing it. All right, I think maybe, um, does anybody want to make a final comment or? Just I want to thank, thank you for inviting me. I've and, had a uh, very interesting evening. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to all of you. And um, so thank you to all our panelists. We do have a brief poll on tonight's program for the audience on Zoom. So if you're watching live on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your answers in the comments below. Um, while you're completing the survey, if you are, um, let me tell you about next week's program, which discusses current energy shortages, particularly in China and India. It's jointly sponsored by the University of Chicago's centers in Hong Kong, Beijing, and New Delhi, and it will begin at 8 p.m. Hong Kong time on Wednesday, January 18th. Um, I am moderating it at 6 a.m. Chicago time, so I may do it without turning my video on, but um, <laughs> it will be there. A panel of energy experts will talk about issues specifically related to the energy problems in China and India and their global implications. They'll cover the market dynamics, the economic impact, the countermeasures from countries trying to stave off for their economic catastrophe, and the possible implications of this for emissions controls as well. Um, make sure to follow the University of Chicago UN campuses, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and website for further information and hope you'll tune in to listen at the next event. Meanwhile, thank you very much for listening tonight and have a great rest of the week. Good morning, good night, wherever you are. <laughs>